So, good morning and welcome to Cognitive Robotics. We are uh, Michael, Jing, Alex, and Andrew, and myself, Michael, and we're the Energy Efficient Path Planning and Uncertain Environments team. And we want to use this day today to actually teach you something that will help you get your dream job. So your dream job has always been being a farmer. Um, you always thought that this is the much cooler job, you will have a much more free time if you do that job. And you feel like now in the 21st century where, where there's all that technology that you can leverage in order to make them do things that, that are your job, you will have an even easier job. However, with all the things that you, with all the vehicles that you can find online uh, and on TV and in shops, uh, um, they, don't, they all don't seem to be up to the job because their range is too low. So you can't actually make them do all the things that you want them to do. Spread pesticides, um, yeah, monitor the growth of your vegetables, um, and monitor the distribution of, of water on your field. Um, so, so you have that problem that they're not up to the job. So you try to add battery, but that only makes them heavier and less performant. So you really uh, think about it more deeply and try to find a solution. But you, can't, you just can't come up with something, so you have to put off your dream job for a while. You're not very happy with that, but you actually have to consider going back to, to hard work. Um, you apply to NASA and you join their autonomous science uh, department. And on your first day, um, the department introduces you to their project. They use autonomous vehicles for doing uh, experiments on, in remote environments, uh, such as in space on the surface of uh, oceans far out and in the depth of the oceans. And while your supervisor explains you all that, you realize that there's one topic that keeps, uh, keeps coming up. So he keeps complaining that in all their uh, applications, their vehicles eventually run out of battery and ruin their missions. And you know that problem, and now you try to solve it. So in your final, in your final year of grad school, uh, you've taken a robotics course, and you remember Monday's lecture, where you've learned how to identify craters, mm -hmm. sand, and cliffs, and other features along the way. But there's still this gap, uh, and you don't know how to use that information. So at the end of the day, you go home and you feel like you've learned two important things today. Uh, mission endurance is inherent to the field of autonomy, and from your own experience trying uh, to add more batteries to the vehicles, you feel like there's only one solution to solving that problem, and that's energy efficient, efficient path planning. Um, as we all, as a group, know that you all go through similar struggles with your dream job, we built a lecture that will actually help you get your dream job. And by the end of this lecture, you will know how to model an energy efficient path planning problem, you will know what makes a good algorithm for such a problem, and eventually you'll be able to pick or design your own algorithm for your specific uh, energy efficient path planning problem. So how do we get there? On the previous slides, you've seen a few examples where energy efficient path planning is really essential for achieving your mission goal. We'll pick the underwater exploration Colombo example as the example that you're most familiar with and use it as a running example throughout our lecture. Starting from this uh, basic example, we will structure our lecture in three parts. In part one, we will analyze the underwater exploration environment um, and come up with the first model of that environment. In part two, we will then uh, apply the conventional approaches that you may uh, know already and check whether there are maybe solutions that you can use for solving the problem that you know already. And in part three, we will then identify gaps of uh, those algorithms and explore some more advanced algorithms. Uh, at the end of our lecture, we will give a short conclusion and um, give you the big picture of the landscape of algorithms that we've been exploring. So let me start uh, with part one and analyze together with you the underwater environment. So I first, I was just going to mention that, right? Actually, one of the students in the class, or actually one of the one of the members of my group, that was his dream job. So he went off about four years ago back to South Africa where his father owns a farm, and I just saw him 
few months ago, and you know, I was a company of 40 people, right, selling drones to do exactly, okay. exactly. <laughs> so I asked him about the energy efficiency part of your yeah. story, but it is a dream job for some MIT students. <laughs> yeah, that's good feedback. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, so in the first, uh, on the first half of our of, of part one, we will identify the features of our environment and identify and derive some uh, requirements for for coming up with a valid model of the requirement. And then we'll go a little bit deeper into modeling and come up with the first model of this environment. So let's have a, have a look at the environment. You're all uh, familiar to some extent with the Colombo underwater um, exploration example. And if you dig a little bit deeper and do a little bit of research on the topic, you will soon find out that this is a very interesting place where you can see a lot of natural phenomena. So for example, there are hydrothermal zones where hot fluids are coming out of the ground. Um, there are places where gases are just steaming up. Um, there are also regions where visibility is very low and there are layers of polymetallic sulfates and sulfates. And of course, because it's a volcano uh, area, there are also areas of, uh, with, where there are local eruption spots so where you can really see lava on the, on the ground of the ocean. Um, so why do we actually have to care about those? Well, if you look at, uh, at all those examples, they're all kind of hazards for our mission. Our vehicle is not de designed to deal with very high temperatures, like the temperatures it could, it could uh, come across when it crosses one of those uh, spots here or here. Um, gases that are steaming up are, are not only a problem for boats, uh, but also for maybe a problem for our AUV because we may lose buoyancy when we cross those zones. And areas like this, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, low visibility and if we, uh, and that may be a problem for navigation underwater um, for our vehicle. But there's more. Of course, like in any uh, underwater environment, we also have uh, time and location dependent currents and we have underwater structures. So more specifically, at Colombo, uh, beyond the the big crater uh, that we all know, there are also expected to be more than 15 smaller cones in that area, and with those, uh, along with those cones also go steep reefs and walls that we have to take into account in our model in order not to crash into them. So now you've seen the basic features of the environment, um, and we can ask ourselves the questions, what are the requirements that we have to satisfy in order to come up with a valid model? Well, we've seen currents, we've seen hazards, different kinds of hazards on the previous slides, but we also have to take into account some theoretical aspects. So there's a famous <laughs> saying that says, that says uh, some models are useful, all models are wrong. So what this means is that there's often a very good reason to model an environment in order to make it simpler and um, better to deal with, but there's also some kind of error or uncertainty associated with that model. And that error may be everything. It may be in, our, in the model of our seafloor, of our vehicle, our current, literally anywhere in our model. But beyond the error in our, in our model, there's also an, uh, some uh, uncertainty that comes with uh, our execution and ability to follow the path. Uh, just remember that our behavior, the behavior of our AUV is non-deterministic and our AUV may sometimes end up somewhere uh, where uh, it would not end, end up if we had deterministic behavior. But beyond those aspects, there's also a practical aspect to model two models. Um, of course, we don't want to have a model that's very complicated, uh, hard to calculate, takes a long time to calculate, or hard to understand. So of course, with our model, we also want to balance simplicity and accuracy. So now we know the requirements for modeling our, requ uh, our, our environment. So what are the things that we have to model? Do you have any, any ideas on that? Of course, we're in a 3D environment. Uh, we, we do an underwater mission, so we have to model physical space, right? And the way we go about modeling the physical space is we take our 3D space and we abstract it to a 2D space. And this uh, simplification is actually uh, a quite common one in literature and is valid because the activities in vertical direction, uh, directions in ocean structures, such as currents, are usually much smaller than the currents in horizontal directions. So this is a step that we can do. And in order to make that, um, that 2D space better, uh, to, give that, to have a better ability of handling it, 
In our second step, we take that 2D sp uh, space and discretize it. So now we've modeled, uh, we, we have a basic model for a physical space. What else is there? Of course, we have a mission, so we have to model the AUV. There are three key uh, simplifications that we, uh, that we made for modeling the AUV. Um, first, we assumed that the thrust of the AUV is always bigger than the force that the current can bring up. So basically what we're saying is that the AUV is always able to overcome the current. Second, we assumed that the thrust of our AUV is constant during our mission. So basically our energy efficient path planning uh, problem comes down to a time uh, minimization problem um, by that uh, simplification. And third, uh, we assume uh, our model does not account for vehicle dynamics, so there's no flow equations, there's no inertia, and this is also a common approach in literature um, uh, that is justified by the fact that usually the vehicle dimensions are much smaller than the region or the area in which the ocean in which the vehicle is acting in, so we can do that simplification. So now we have our 3D space in our AUV. What else is there? Of course, we have obstacles. We've seen that earlier with our with the cones on the earlier slides. And the way we, yeah. Uh, so as far as there being no inertia in the model, how are you going from um, velocity to energy expenditure then? Like, don't you have to model drag to figure that out? Uh, yeah, that, that would be uh, uh, a physical way to go from velocity to energy. But we, we uh, take the approach that we say, uh, we, we take a, a constant velocity that we set at some at some level, and then we say uh, we want to spend as uh, as less time as possible at that going with that thrust and velocity. Um, yeah, and the way we go about modeling those uh, obstacles is with 3D functions. So we have a function of f uh, of x and y, two horizontal coordinates, that gives us the value, the depth value of the surface of the reef. And then we take this uh, 3D function, and uh, because we have, uh, we have modeled our physical space as a 2D space, and just slice it as a certain depth. So you can see that here, we decided to do our mission on 9.5 meters depth. So we just took a slice through our obstacle here and abstracted the obstacle uh, from the 3D function in our 2D space. So we know where our obstacles are now. So you can see this approach only relies on a function of x and y, and that's actually pretty great because it gives us a lot of flexibility in modeling. In this case, we have a continuous function, but we're not restricted to using continuous functions. We could also have non-continuous functions, um, um, and we could, uh, we could also de uh, de uh, deal with sparse data as well as a lot of data. So we're, we're really flexible only uh, flexible because we only we only need a, a function that returns a value if we give it a, an x and y value. And furthermore, that also gives us compatibility with the real world because we're not restricted to simplifying obstacle sh uh, shapes to polygons or something. We can really represent any shapes, any paths uh, that describe our, our obstacles. So now we've uh, seen obstacles, um, we've seen our 3D space, our AUV, we've modeled all those things. Uh, what else do you remember from the, from the first slide? Is there, um, do you remember uh, on the first slide of the environment, there was maybe uh, um, lava, right? So what we have to model is also hazards. We've seen hydrothermal zones, gases, low visibility. And if you really think about it, it could literally be anything. So those were just a few examples. But hazards could be anything. We can't even mention all those things. And hazards are, can be anything that, that are danger to our mission or a hazard to our mission. So let's just define those regions where we have things like that as hazard regions. And those hazard re regions are any regions that may put our mission at risk. So with this def uh, definition, that's great. We have now a bucket, uh, th that bucket of hazard regions where we, could, uh, we, where we can put anything in that we're unsure about, that we don't know what happens there, how often it happens there, what are the mechanisms. Um, but the question remains, how do we encode this? So earlier, we've been talking about obstacles. And at first sight, those obstacles seem to be quite different. Because obstacles are regions that you never want to enter, right? Because it will always mean you crash into the obstacle. <clears throat> However, hazard regions are different because they may be entered if the benefit is high enough. The hazard is not always present, and the hazard doesn't always mean that your mission will fail. 
So if you look at that example given here, if the benefit is low and you have a start and a goal at opposite sides of the hazard regions, um, you don't want to risk uh, going through that hazard region and rather go around it. But if the benefit is high enough, you uh, definitely want to go the straight way and uh, just go through the hazard regions. So what we can see is actually that there is an element that unites obstacles and hazard regions. There are both areas uh, that contain some kind of hazard for our mission. So let's introduce the notion of risk, which is probability times uh, is the product of pro probability and severity. And uh, in our case, we decided to model the risk uh, as a, a value between zero and one, with one being the highest risk, zero being the lowest risk. So that way we can actually assign a scalar value to each point in our grid. So if you look at the example here, we have an obstacle here and we can assign the value of one to each point in our grid that lies within the obstacle. Um, that's also a common approach called uh, map discretization. Um, and can assign a value of R to each point in the grid uh, that is within a hazard region. And that's the way how we bring those two together. So now we've brought obstacles and hazards, hazards together. Now there's only one element left. Of course, because it's an underwater exploration mission, we also have to model ocean currents. For ocean currents, we assume that we have complete uh, knowledge, which is valid because this is data that is available from research institutes, from databases. And we furthermore assume that those currents are invariant in time. And this is also a common assumption or simplification made in uh, research papers, because ocean currents in general are known to change very slowly over time. And the way we model those is we take uh, the ocean currents and we present them as a vector field. That means for each point, uh, for, for each point in our grid, we assign a vector value to that point in the grid and get a 2D vector field. So, so now we've modeled all the elements of our uh, environment, and we can sum up what we have. So what we, took is, what we did is we took the real world environment, um, we uh, abstracted it to a 2D space, we discretized it, uh, and assigned a value of, uh, of r between 0 and 1 to each point in our grid. Then we took this uh, and brought, uh, and by this step we brought the obstacles and the hazard regions together. And then we took this basic model and added a 2D vector field on it, and what we ended up is our mission models where we can see the obstacles, hazard regions with different values of R, and a current. So let me now hand over the lecture to Michael, who will use our basic model to apply conventional approaches to them. So before you transition, right, so, so in this case, you, you kind of said from our problem, right, and how would you train it, right? Um, error fiction at planning, right? So how does that relate to the state of the art in the literature in terms of how to be energy efficient at planning? And the answer may be they don't, but. Um, Sorry, can, can you. So, so you, what you presented was how you your team would model this problem, right? right? right. How does that relate to what's out there in the literature in terms of how to do energy efficient path planning or how to frame the problem? Yeah, so in the literature, I would say uh, a large part of the literature is taking similar approaches, but uh, we discretize the space and some of the approaches that we've seen do not seem, uh, do not, uh, seem to do that. To do that. Uh, but um, we've taken that just as an initial approach to a, to a model to be able to apply our conventional approaches and we will later see that there are other approaches out there, other algorithms that do not have, do not uh, rely on discretizing the space, and we will see those approaches uh, that we've seen in literature. And can you just quickly say what's the relative benefit of discretizing or not? Now, in this case, you're talking about discretizing state and discretizing time, right? I think we have we're a whole section on that later on. Yeah. <laughs> cool. We're going to talk so hopefully, about hopefully by the end of the lecture, you have questions. Okay, so that will be separate from the advanced algorithms we'll, that will also include how it's being framed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think we can have time for one question. Uh, is it normal for the like, polynomial vehicle assumption, or uh, is there examples of literature of like, motion constraints? There are definitely examples. Um, for example, with non polynomial you get like Dubin's curves planners. Um, in, in our case, we're kind of considering the path planning problem rather than kind of the path following problem. 
Um, we kind of touch on this a bit later, but you might have seen in like Melissa's path planner, you have this higher level path planner, and then we're kind of assuming you have some other low level controller which we'll deal with that on, on the middle screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. Now that Michael's introduced our model and kind of analyzed the scenario and figured out some requirements, we can finally get onto some path planning. So at this point, you're probably all wondering whether or not you can apply the methods that you already know, namely things like A star or Dijkstra, to this problem and how they would perform. So that's what we're going to do in this section of the lecture. And in particular, I'm going to have uh, two objectives with this part. Firstly, I'm just going to use A star and Dijkstra as kind of a method for formulating a cost function, which we could use for evaluating paths in terms of energy efficiency uh, and the other things we care about that Michael uh, mentioned. And then I'm going to go on to looking at a performance assessment of these methods, A star and Dijkstra, which we can then kind of piggyback off and build on those for more advanced, uh, more advanced algorithms later on. So based on what Michael just described about the model, we have some kind of high-level path planning requirements. So obviously we want to find a short path from a start point to an end goal. But in our case, we also want the path to be energy efficient. I'll talk about what that means in a second. And avoiding hazards and obstacles. So how could we use things like A star or Dijkstra? Well, the most important thing about A star and Dijkstra is you have to come up with a cost function or a way of evaluating a path, uh, how good a path is or how favorable it is. So obviously the idea in terms of currents is that if we follow a path that moves with the currents, we um, use less energy fighting against the currents and ultimately we'll achieve a more energy efficient path. So you can imagine that this was a kind of iteration or a execution of the path like A star where you're following the current at each node. So I just wanted to re reiterate a point that Michael made about energy efficiency. So there's an important assumption that we're making here, which is that the thrust that the AUV applies is constant. So what this means is that the AUV is outputting a constant power with time. We're not modeling things like drag, but it's kind of just a first level assumption. And so what that means practically is that the speed of the AUV relative to the current is going to be constant. So we're going to assume that the AUV uh, velocity vector relative to the current is this V AUV vector. And you additionally have this V current vector at your current location. And the direction that the, actu that the AUV actually moves, or rather the velocity, is going to be the, the sum of V AUV, the applied velocity, and the current velocity. So Michael alluded to this earlier, but because the AUV power output is constant, the most energy efficient path is also going to be the most time efficient path, or rather the, the, the path with the shortest time to traverse it. So with that in mind, we're going to take a little bit of a different approach from what you might be used to and define the cost of a path in terms of time rather than distance. So what you often see in these methods is using just a Euclidean distance. What we'll be doing is looking at the time required to traverse that Euclidean distance, which is going to allow us to take into account the currents. So an overview of how we do that. The first thing we have to do is choose the direction of this V AUV vector. Remember, we assume that the magnitude of that vector is constant. So we're going to choose it so that the resultant vector points us in the direction that we want to go. Secondly, we're going to uh, sum up the contributions from V current and V AUV and work out the speed that we'll be traveling towards that goal. And with that, we can compute the cost, which is the time it would take us to traverse that. So to just give you a little bit of insight, if you were at an iteration of A star or Dijkstra's method and you were um, evaluating this node and you had three potential nodes to traverse to, what we want to know is the cost of making each of these options. So you can probably see intuitively which should have the lowest cost, but let's see how that manifests manif mathematically. So the idea is that if we were evaluating option A, we would have to choose the direction of the AUV such that the resultant of these two vectors points us in the right direction. Then we would look at the contribution from each of these vectors in that direction, sum them up, and that would give us this black vector, which is the kind of resultant um, velocity of the AUV. And the magnitude of that vector gives us the speed with which we can calculate the time. So obviously, if we chose option C, you'd get the opposite thing happening. Now you'd have to apply your V AUV in a direction which is fighting against the current. And so your net uh, velocity vector would be much shorter. And so it would take you a lot longer to get to option C. So to put that concretely, this is how we do that mathematically. So like I said, the first step is to calculate the required V AUV. And the idea there is to choose the direction such that it will offset the V current and point you in the correct uh, direction to your goal. So basically you want the perpendicular components um, perpendicular to the direction you want to travel of V AUV and V current to offset each other, subject to this constraint that the magnitude of V AUV is constant. So 
the way we do that is by rearranging this equation and substituting it back in. Now this is a quadratic equation, uh, a quadratic constraint, so you end up with a quadratic equation that you have to solve. This gives us multiple solutions, and the way we check for the correct solution is by basically plugging all the solutions back in and checking for which one actually gives us the greatest speed to go. So if we solve this system of equations, we've computed the direction of the AUV, and we know the magnitude of that based on the AUV's power output. So the next thing is to compute the speed in the goal direction. That's basically the sum of the two velocity vectors in the direction you want to go. And finally, we can compute the time to goal. So does that make sense, how we incorporate the currents into the cost function? Good. So another thing you might be thinking is if we wanted to use this cost function in something like A star, we'd need to turn it into an admissible heuristic. So if we just kind of appro approach this naively and applied the same uh, cost function from any node directly to the goal, you would notice that we're not necessarily underestimating the cost, which we need to do for it to be an admissible heuristic. So the way we overcome that is by instead of using the actual current in the heuristic, we assume that there's a maximal current pushing you towards the goal. And so this just makes, our, makes sure our, um, our heuristic is always going to be underestimating the cost and it makes it admissible for something like A star. So that covers how we incorporate currents into the risk, uh, currents into the cost function. Now let's look at how we incorporate risk. The first thing we do is introduce this tunable risk tolerance parameter, which we call alpha. Basically, that is just saying how much are you going to tolerate risk. So if you set alpha to be one, you're ignoring risk entirely. If you set alpha to be zero, you're saying I don't tolerate any risk. And basically, any value within the range zero to one is a valid value of alpha. And recall that these uh, risk values over your discretized space um, can also be in the range zero to one. And so the way we apply that to our cost function is through this thing we call the risk factor, which is basically modifying the cost based on the risk of that node. So if it's a very risky node and you have r equal to one, then uh, this factor is basically gonna be um, a very large factor. So you're gonna be amplifying the cost because it's a very risky move. On the other hand, if you set alpha to be zero, um, you would not modify the cost at all, so you'd kind of just leave it be. So that's how we incorporate risk into the cost function. So now you're asking, how does that perform? So uh, in these little animations, we're going to be using Dijkstra just because it gives a nice intuition for how the cost function performs. So what you're seeing here is a mission where the AUV starts <coughs> at this position here and has a goal position up here with this kind of whirlpool current. And what you're seeing with this blue region expanding is essentially um, contours of constant cost. So as the method is searching, um, this kind of region of constant cost is, play that again, is expanding. And you can see that, um, for example, the cost to come with the currents is much shorter, uh, much smaller than the cost to fight against the currents. And the result is that basically you can traverse much further if you go with the currents versus fighting against the currents. And with this in mind, the result that you would find from running either A star or Dijkstra with this problem is you would actually take the longer path, which takes into account the currents. And just as a kind of a sanity check, if we turn the currents up to be basically as strong as they possibly can, you'll see that the AUV basically can't push against the currents at all, um, and it's only allowed to travel with the currents. So with that, uh, hopefully you now understand how we incorporate both the currents in terms of energy efficiency, um, and uh, the incurred risk into our cost function. And now in this final section, I'm gonna hand you over to Alex, who's gonna start looking at how we can improve on these methods. Hello everyone, my name's Alex. So, I hope you're all excited, we solved our problem. We have a path from A to B, and it takes into account our currents and our risk, and uses them in some way to give us a path. So, there we go, we have the solution. Now, I'm guessing a lot of you aren't very satisfied. Uh, a star, Dijkstra, all of you probably learned about these a few years ago. They've been around for half a century. Uh, we can definitely do a lot better. So in this next section, uh, we're going to talk about some of the algorithms that we use to improve on A star and Dijkstra. And the way we're going to talk about that is through a lens of some of the limitations that A star has and then how we can improve on those. So without further ado, the first limitation that we came across was that the shortest path that A star gives us is extremely close to the obstacle. Now, in a perfect world, this might be fine, and then that helps you get an optimal path. However, we all know that there's a lot of problems with this. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in this world, and Michael talked about it earlier. Uh, there's some uncertainty in our model because of the assumptions that we made or some things that we just don't know. 
there's also some error that might occur when our vehicle is actually trying to follow the path. So if we have this path that is right next to the obstacle and something goes wrong and it doesn't follow it exactly, we crash into the obstacle and our mission's over. So obviously this isn't something that we want to happen. Uh, additionally, there might be uncertainty in how we measure the currents or how we model where the hazards actually are. So really there's a lot of uncertainty that goes into this problem and a lot of ways that this could go wrong. So we're starting here with A star. We have paths too close to the obstacles. How are we going to fix this? One way that you might have already seen, as long as you're coming to lecture, is um, <laughs> iterative risk allocation. However, we've already talked about that, so we're not going to go through that one again. But we do have another option. Uh, this thing called map smoothing is applying a Gaussian kernel across the space that we have and basically smooths out our obstacles and adds a little tail to the end of them, a small amount of probability around the outside that we might collide with that obstacle. So this picture up here to the, to the right shows a good demonstration of this. Instead of having our zeros and then ones start immediately where there's an obstacle, we now have a smoother. Is it a problem that you're actually decreasing the risk the, if inside the obstacle? Like if you look there? So the way we're modeling the, yeah, I see what you're saying. The way we're modeling our risk with the obstacle is including it in our cost function, right? So if we make this arbitrarily large, like just tall wise, as far as how we incorporate the risk, it doesn't actually become an issue. Um, but this is a nice visual to at least understand now we have this smoothed out with some risk areas around the outside of the obstacle. So what this essentially does is it makes our obstacles slightly wider. And now when we're incorporating this in our cost function, depending on how much we weight risk and how much we weight optimality to getting to the goal quickly, we now have a situation where um, this small risk tail on the outside of the obstacle actually gets included in our function for deciding the path. So what it ends up doing is taking a map that we have like this and kind of blurring it out a little bit, giving us a little bit more safety margin, and gives us a path that now doesn't take the corner quite so sharply. So this is just a, another easy way to deal with uncertainty. Um, one in the fact that our map might not be modeled exactly. Now we explicitly model this uncertainty by just kind of making everything slightly bigger. And then also in the motion of the vehicle, um, any mistakes that might happen now aren't going to be quite as costly because we're planning to be a little bit farther away from the obstacles. How do you decide like the rate at which you use the obstacle? So we didn't really look into that too much. Um, I think empirically would probably be a good way to do it. And then I'm sure there are some ways to actually prove whether or not this is the best plan. Um, but we didn't actually look into that too much. Yeah, yeah, the uncertainty really matters as well, like how certain you are about your model. So how is this, I guess, better than just applying like a constant like circle around the obstacle or whatever, like every time just like apply like 0 0.5 or something? I mean, that's essentially what we're doing, but like another step farther. So we have a circle immediately around the obstacle that has high risk and then a circle slightly larger around the obstacle that has slightly slower risk, lower risk and so on. So that's what the Gaussian actually does for us. It just iteratively, as you go farther away, the risk goes down. So it's the same idea, just a little farther love. So in our scenario, it blurs out our obstacles a little bit, and it actually leads to our path being taken, not going through this really tight region here. Um, so yeah. So now we have some options to deal with the path being too close to the obstacles. So let's move on to our next limitation. This is something that we brought up as a modeling assumption at the very beginning, is that we are confining our path planning to a uniform grid. However, we don't actually have to do this, and there are reasons why we shouldn't, because there are some problems that, become, that appear when you start to do this. So, as you all may know, A star is optimal. However, the way you define optimal really matters, because A star is optimal up to the discretization of your grid, and so if you discrete discretize your grid very poorly, an optimal path might not really look optimal. And you can see this in this, this GIF over here. Um, the AUV that we have traveling here really does not follow the currents in a way you'd expect it to during an optimal path. Um, and additionally, you can see we, we kind of made a visualization so that the direction the AUV is facing 
shows how which direction it needs to thrust to follow this path exactly. And since this current in this uh, simulation is extremely high, there's points like right here where the AV is fighting almost completely against the path it's trying to go. So this is extremely inefficient, and this is the exact opposite of what we're trying to solve. Uh, and another problem is this path is non-differentiable. So right here, the AV completely flips direction. That's not realistic and not something we're going to actually be able to do when we're trying to follow these paths. So this is actually kind of answers the question that was brought up earlier about um, creating paths that can be followed. And then finally, uh, playing stuff on grids has the same problem with the curse of dimensionality that I'm sure everyone's heard over and over again. Uh, large spaces and high dimensions don't really work great with discrete grids. So what are some ways that we can fix this problem? We will go into some algorithms that allow you to traverse at any angle. And to begin with, I'll talk about a potential field method, which models our environment as positive charges for obstacles, a positive charge for your AUV, and a negative charge for the goal. And this effectively repels your AUV from obstacles while pulling it towards the goal. Uh, another way you can think of this is putting the goal at the bottom of a basin or a bowl, and then putting a marble somewhere else in that bowl and having it roll down the bowl to get to the global minimum, which is our goal. So in this picture, it would be right here. And then adding an obstacles as basically bumps in the road that the marble can't go over. And so then when you add them together, the marble will start in any arbitrary location and roll down to the minimum where we have our goal location. So once you have the, the uh, once you have modeled the environment this way, there's uh, numerous different ways you can find a solution. The one that is most known is gradient descent. Um, you use it in a lot of machine learning algorithms, but it also applies here. Uh, you can also do some methods like quasi-Newton method, which is now a second order method and requires computing a Hessian, which can be a bit difficult and unwieldy to do, but will give you faster convergence. Needless to say, there's a lot of ways you can solve this problem once you have it modeled this way. Um, okay, what is BFGS? BFGS, oh, good call. So that's a bunch of names. Those are the names of the person who came up with one of these algorithms. Um, so actually knowing what the names are doesn't give you any more intuition about what the algorithm is. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out, though, because I do have a random uh, acronym there. But yeah, it's like broken something, so yeah, I don't even remember, honestly. Uh, so you may be able to envision a problem with these uh, potential field methods, that being that local minima might become an issue. So in our top right picture there, we have two obstacles, and the goal and then the AV is on the opposite side of the obstacles. And since those two obstacles are creating a positive repulsive charge, it's possible that the AV gets stuck in a local minima like this one, which is visualized in 3D over there. It's a little hard to see, but basically the repulsive uh, force from the obstacles would offset the vehicle from getting pulled towards the goal. So this is one potential problem with these algorithms. However, there's a fix. Uh, it is a little complicated. Uh, so I'm not going to go in too depth into it, but you can see that we've made a graph by transforming this one over there that allows you to go around this region, but doesn't give you the ability to go through the optimal between the two. So there is ways to get around it, but there are definitely some hiccups with this uh, algorithm. Okay, so the whole point of this lecture is adding in the currents and doing things energy efficiently, right? So how are we going to do that? Intuitively, the first thought you might have is, well, let's just model it the same way we model the obstacles as well as the rest of the environment. We'll fit a surface to our uh, currents, and we'll just add it in with the rest of them. However, you start to think about it, and the currents are a vector field, so that doesn't really make sense. So how about we just add the vec current vectors directly to our gradient that we calculate when we're trying to do gradient descent or something like that. That kind of works, but it doesn't give you the optimal path by any means, um, and it's not great. So, example of us implementing it, it kind of follows the current a little bit, but then it doesn't really. And then this example over here, you can see if we're starting here and we want to get to this goal region, adding in our currents uh, directly to the gradient doesn't tell us that 
going this way isn't going to be the best path. It doesn't tell us that we should go around to take these currents. Uh, so we need to be a little smarter about how we're adding in our currents. And the solution to this is modeling them similarly to how we model obstacles. So we take the cross product of our current location to the goal vector with the velocity at our current location. And if the cross product is positive, it's helping us towards our goal. We're going to put a negative um, term in the gradient, so pushing you towards the goal. And if it's in the opposite direction, we'll push you backwards away from the goal. So kind of high level, that's how it would work. We're not going to go too much more into detail about it. Yeah. Doesn't this face the issue that you are now have the non-conservative force effectively, if you're thinking of the gradient as being a potential field? Like, what if it just follows goes in the loop? Right. Um, so we still have the fact that there's gradient from this where we are to the goal. So that will still force you towards the goal. Okay. Makes sense. So it, we're, we're, it's additive terms, and we already have this thing that's going to start forcing to the goal. There are some problems that do occur, and it, it gets complicated, which is part of the reason why we're going to talk about some other algorithms, because there is a lot of stuff that goes into making this work. It's pretty hard to model, and there's some things that don't work great. So let's go back to the graphs that we had before. Some of the things that we talked about was the fact that the graph, the path looked a little weird. Uh, with A star, you can only really take horizontal, vertical, or 45 degree paths. So let's see if we can relax that constraint a little bit to make our path look a little more natural. The first idea to do this is you smooth the path that's given by A star afterwards. So you can take out some intermediate nodes, and now we can have paths that travel at different angles. However, this doesn't always work. So this red path right here is actually an optimal path given by A star. Um, and those little gray blocks are obstacles. If you try to smooth it afterwards, there's not really a lot you can do because the way this algorithm works, it searches for like ways you can connect this node to this node or something, for example. And there's an obstacle in the way, so, in the way, so that won't work. However, there is a path that's much better, which is this blue line. So maybe we should try something else. That leads us to an algorithm called theta star, which basically does the same smoothing idea, but while you're making the path. So in this algorithm, when you add a new node to the path, so in this case, we're starting here, I believe, and we add a new node, and then we add a new node. This node, instead of when we're adding it, making the parent the node that it came from, we make the parent the best node that's visible to it. So best node that's in the line of sight that gives us the shortest path. So instead of adding this node directly as the parent to this one, we can add this one, and now we have a shorter path. And so if you do that as you're creating your path, you now have a shorter segment and have a more optimal path. And they can be arbitrarily far away as long as it's in the line of sight. Mm -hmm. yes. So we have a new algorithm. It's still complete. It's still correct. And the paths are generally a lot shorter than A star. But they're still not optimal in continuous space. And they also still require the dense uniform grid problem that we had before. Uh, it's something that's not super easy to get around. So that's why we're kind of discussing a bunch of different options that you have. Um, if you really want to get the most optimal path, though, in continuous space, you can do A star on a visibility graph. However, this takes a really long time. Uh, the idea behind this is you connect edges between the points, various like, edge points, or yeah, various corners of obstacles, and then you plan a path through that. Um, so this is fast, but, or sorry, it's really slow. It gives you the optimal path, um, but it also runs into the problem where you're now really close to obstacles again. How does visibility work if you have like smoothed out obstacles? So rather than it just being a binary zero or one? Right, so those don't interface great together. Um, it requires a little bit of creativity to actually make them work together. Um, so I, I think the idea would be that you plan the path originally with the dis or like the solid obstacles that we had before, and then you can add a smoothing to kind of push things away a little bit. Um, but yeah, these things, they require a little bit of creativity to interface together, for sure. So for option three, I saw option three was the any angle, is that right? Data start, yes. Data start. Right, so um, isn't it using, isn't it exploring the visibility graph as a subset? Because it is so at each point considering any, any point that's visible. 
Yeah, so interestingly enough, this uh, actually, I don't remember exactly how, how it was explained, but this does check a lot fewer edges. It ends up checking a lot fewer edges every time. And I don't remember off the top of my head, maybe Michael, do you know? I think, I think to your point, like, it would be equivalent to the visibility graph if you happen to have your uniform grid lining up with all the obstacle corners. Okay. Then it would give you the same path. But if you had your obstacles kind of in between grid nodes, then that's what we mean by it wouldn't be exactly optimal in the continuous space. So you can squeeze out a little more optimality by moving to this. Okay, yeah. If you had like a, a current, is it possible that the, the optimal path would be on the visibility graph? Because like you'd want to go like all the way around. Yes, that is process. correct. So yes, that that is this would be optimal, I guess, if we're not considering our currents. Um, that's a good point. Uh, so here we just wanted to show you some comparisons with the path length that's uh, uh, resulting from these algorithms, as well as the time that it takes to compute them. So from all of these, theta star seems to give us the best result. And so now we have a few answers for how we're going to deal with the fact that planning on a uniform grid doesn't work so well or doesn't look so great. So with that, Jamie's going to continue with a few more algorithm, algorithms that we discussed to solve some of the other problems and limitations. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about two more limitations. The first one um, the approach is the fact that sometimes paths may have to be replanned. So say we're starting off with A star and we plan some route for A, B to go on to reach the goal. And along the way, we encounter an obstacle that we did not expect to see before. This may be due to inaccuracies in the initial mapping or just natural changes in an uncertain environment. So we'll have to replan. This may be an issue because in environments like our underwater volcano, there may be we may have to replan frequently due to just all the uncertainty and changes. And in a large environment, this can be extremely computationally expensive. So we really don't want to start over from scratch every time we see something new. So we want to see if we can reuse as much of our initial plan as possible. Our goal for approaching this problem is to look for algorithms that can incrementally repair the paths only around the AUD whenever we encounter new obstacles. So there's a bunch of algorithms for that. Uh, first one, um, well, yeah, we'll take a look at how to approach. So the first one I'm going to talk about is dynamic A star, which is also known as D star. This one's pretty popular. It's been used in the field a lot. Uh, essentially, it's an incremental heuristic search algorithm with dynamic cost parameters, being that we can update the edge costs and things whenever we get new information. The benefits that, like A star, it's optimal and complete. We'll always find the best solution if it exists. And it only it tries its best to recalculate locally and avoid backtrack as much as possible. So this makes it much more efficient than just running A star again. Um, I'm going to give a simplified overview about this. Um, essentially, for the setup, every node's going to try to maintain the distance to the goal. We're going to add nodes to the priority queue and say they're open. Uh, and every node is going to have a back pointer to the previous node that it was extended from. There's going to be two main phases. The expansion phase, where we're just going to go out and try to cal calculate all the initial costs for all the nodes in the graph to the goal. And then the follow phase, where you try to follow the back pointers of these nodes to get from the start to the goal. And along the way, we have to see whether or not we have to update any of these costs. So this might make a little bit more sense with uh, this demo. So for every node up there, I'm going to try to keep track of two costs. H is going to represent the best cost to go, and K is going to be the current path cost or the, the cost to come. In this environment here, I have a start node and a goal node and one known obstacle. So first for the expansion phase, um, we're just going to start by opening the goal node, figuring out the cost there, and then expanding its neighbors, opening those, calculating the costs as well. Um, for now, I'm just going to be using the, for this example, I'm just using the Euclidean distance, but you can easily change this heuristic to match the ones that we've talked about earlier in this presentation. So uh, we keep doing that, calculating the costs, moving along, until we eventually figure out the costs, the initial costs for all the nodes on here. And since we have all the back pointers, we can just easily figure out what the best route for AD is to reach the goal from the start. Uh, so let's send it along. 
it's going and it's going, and it encounters an obstacle that it didn't know about before. So uh, by the algorithm, we're going to just go ahead and add all of these nodes that are affected to our open list and reevaluate all of them based on the key. First, we're also going to have to pay attention to the fact that this cost is no longer going to be a small value 3. It's going to be something larger. I'm going to just make it 100 for now, just some large cost to go because we don't really want to go from this obstacle. Um, so yeah, we evaluate all these nodes in the order of the path class key. This one is unaffected by the obstacle, so it doesn't really change. That one's unaffected by the obstacle, so it doesn't change. This one's the obstacle itself, so you can't really improve the costs there because you don't want to be in it in the first place, and so forth. We do this for a few more nodes and add some more onto the open list. So now we're on this node where the AEV is on itself, and because its back pointer is pointing towards the obstacle, it has a very high cost to go. So we're going to check its neighbors to see if there's any way we can reduce the cost. And it turns out we can. We just have to change our back pointer from the obstacle node to that node up there. And the benefits of having these um, dynamic incremental algorithms is that we don't actually have to go and evaluate every single one of reevaluate every single one of these nodes before. There's still there's some other small steps in between, but essentially we can ignore the most majority of the points back here because we already have found a way to reduce the cost <coughs> of where we currently are. So now we can just kind of go ahead, send our AV along on this new improved route, and everything's good. So that's D star, but it turns out that D star is not the only algorithm out there that can help with free planning. Um, there's actually a whole family that's based off of D star, and Andrew is going to talk about one of them, which is known as D star life. Um, <coughs> so D star light is built off uh, another algorithm called lifelong planning. And how lifelong planning basically works is that um, if you're trying to get to a place, uh, the people that know the most about um, how to that know the most about how to get where you want to go is your neighbors. So it'll ask its neighbors for information, and then it'll choose the best neighbors um, to visit, so that we don't have to visit all our neighbors. And um, we basically add LPA to D star light, and um, this gets us an algorithm that's at least <coughs> as efficient as D star, and it has become uh, one of the more popular. Uh, algorithms because of this. Um, so like the star, it also recalculates paths. So it will um, uh, measure the cost of a path from the distance to the goal node. So the cost to go. And, and then every time it uh, calculates a path, it will move the start node to the next best node. And then it will try to calculate a new path. Um, so because D star light uh, happens to be a lot simpler to implement than D star, uh, we're able to add a few more things such as uh, it's a lot easier to add heuristic functions um, and also break ties to, to decide uh, which neighbors uh, to go to next and this allows it to be more efficient. Um, so a basic overview, in the beginning we will initially... Sorry, can you, can you Clarify how the D star and lifelong planning A star, how are those, di those different? Um, Maybe you said it. But. So, <coughs> uh, lifelong planning um, is in, so A star will only calculate it, uh, the path just once from the start to the goal. And then if you, if the map changes, or your robot moves, then you have to run A star all over again. Yeah, and my question was about what's the difference between LP, A star, and D star. So both of them are incremental algorithms, but how are they different? Um, I'm not too sure. They're just different implementations. Like D star and D star layer, um, they all have the same functionality in the end, but they're just different implementations that have them. So actually, so D star and LPA star are actually solving two different problems. 
Right, so that's what I was trying to bring out. Right, so, so D star says, given that I have a destination I want to get to, right, and I could be anywhere on the map, right, then it computes the best policy to get from anywhere to the destination, and then the incremental algorithm says if the map changes, then it will incrementally update that policy. So it's solving a single destination shortest path problem, right? A star is given an initial state and a goal state compute a path. So it's only focused on that, that subset rather than from any possible states. So A star is much more focused than, than B star, which is based on Dijkstra's, right? Um, so, so those are so it's important that those are different. So in those cases where you want to solve problems where you can be dropped off anywhere, right, and then you're working through an uncertain environment and getting some destination, then you would use D star. But if you know your initial state, right, and then you know what your target is, then you'd like to do it based on an A star. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Then there is the question: Is is D star solving light solving an A star like problem? Like LPA star, or is it solving a Dijkstra like problem? You know, as in D star. Do you, do you know? Uh, D star light is also um, solving like in any source in a single destination problem. Okay, similar to D star. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so, an overview of D star light. We will first. Um, initialize all the nodes with infinite distance to the goal and then we'll add the goal node to the queue and this is because um, we will actually be traveling from the goal back to the start uh, this is because uh, it's an incremental algorithm so when we move the start node um, all the nodes that save the distances to the goal will remain constant um, and then we will loop we have a queue of nodes that we want to explore, and we will loop through all the nodes and update all their distance values. Um, and then we will calculate the best path, path from uh, those distance values. Uh, after that, we move to the next best point. We, so we move our start point um, along our path, and then we will check if we see any edge changes, uh, changes in edge costs, or if we encounter any obstacles. And if we do, then we will change um, the distance values again and then repeat this process. Uh, so here I have a video of a, dem a short demonstration if it's uh, a little bit confusing. Uh, okay, so. Uh, this is the the start, the start, uh, the robot, and then the green square is the goal, and then the yellow square is what it's uh, the nodes that it's visiting to uh, update the distance. And what you see is in the beginning, it will sort of go through most of the map to uh, calculate the distances, and then, uh, and then the the robot will be on its path until. We see that uh, I add a wall right here, and then it sort of has to recalculate uh, all the distances and to find a new path. Yeah, so right now it's just going through all. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah. How does it know that you added a wall? Does are you telling it specifically that there's going to change in the heuristic, or is it? Uh, yes. Right. Um, basically, um, yeah, so the robot can sort of like sense a certain distance ahead, and if it uh, sees a wall, then it will know and sort of update the map. And then um, in this example, um, because the the wall was sort of close to the goal. You saw that the robot had to search, um, sort of look at a lot of nodes to update their distances. And this isn't uh, really as efficient as um, A, A star. Um, what D star light is efficient at is when um, 
the robot cannot see very far, and um, it only uh, it, it sees close objects. And when it sees close objects, it's able to update um, the, the distances very fast. So here is uh, a graph of nodes, and then so for every node, we will have three values. Uh, the first is g, which is the objective function. Um, so it is our cost to go to the goal. And this is what we will use to calculate the path. Uh, we have an RHS value, um, which is, uh, I'll explain this uh, more later, but it's objective function value with one step ahead. So it will sort of look forward and look at any uh, changes in edge costs and then yeah, keep track of them. And then h is our heuristic function um, that we can add and in my example I used the minimum number of nodes to reach the goal. I mean the minimum number of nodes to reach the start uh, so that our heuristic is um, admissible. And then the edge cost of, the, of our graph um, it's just an edge cost, and we can we can definitely put in the edge cost that uh, we explained earlier that factors in currents and the risk. Okay. Um, so let's say uh, I have a graph here, and then I change the the cost of an edge. Okay, and then subsequently I would want to. Um, I would then have to update my uh, g cost, my cost to go, uh, because it isn't correct anymore. It should actually be, actually be seven plus two, which is nine. Um, however, if some other node connected to this also happens to change its edge or its path to go, and then this thing might have to change again, and. If, it, if we keep on changing it, that means we have to do a lot of like unnecessary calculations. It's best that we change uh, these values as few times as possible. Uh, so what this algorithm will be doing is uh, keeping this RHS value. Uh, it will basically be uh, temporarily storing a value until we know for sure it is the correct value. And um, we'll see later that this way can reduce the number of nodes that we need to expand. Um, so how it's basically calculated is that it looks at all um, its successors, um, cost to go, and then you add the edge cost to that uh, cost to go, and then we take the minimum out of all of those. Um, yeah, and then so the way we choose the nodes um, in order to expand our distance values uh, we, we have a priority queue. So <clears throat> to be able to expand the fewest nodes as possible, we want to expand the nodes that are most likely on the best path. So we will keep a queue to uh, update the better nodes first. And then the key value for the queue is basically um, our cost to go plus the heuristic. Uh, we actually have the minimum of our objective function and the RHS. And then as a secondary key, we just have the, the minimum of the objective function and RHS to uh, break ties. Um, yeah, so you can see in this example for the two nodes on the left, um, we take the minimum of R and G, which is one, and then That is actually wrong. Um, so this would actually be 1 plus 3, which is the heuristic. So it would be uh, 4 semicolon 1. And then the bottom one is 7 semicolon 5. OK. Um, yeah, so now that we have our cube, we also need to know how to update our nodes. And <coughs> we only need to uh, change the node distance when RHS is not equal to GS. So that means we have an inconsistency and then some edge path change 
so that we need to update our distance values. And if they're the same, then we don't need to do any calculations. And then um, when RHS equals GS, uh, this happens a lot. Um, this happens a lot, and then it just we just don't need to look at as many nodes as A star. Okay, so uh, for the over consistent case where GS is greater than RHS, um, the new path is better than the old path. So, so we don't really have to calculate anything if the new path is better. We can just set the better path as the actual path. And then we tell all our neighbors that we found the better path, and then um, they can update their own values. Uh, for an under consistent path where the new path is worse than the old path, um, we will, we then don't actually know what the best path could be. It could be the new path that we got, or it could be something better than the new path. So we set um, G to be, be infinity because we don't know, and then we will update our RHS to be, um, we will update our RHS according to the new information that we got, and then we will tell this to the predecessors of the node, and then we'll put everything into the queue so we can recalculate. Um, so here I have an example uh, of an inconsistent. Um, so say I change um, the edge from D to B, to, uh, B to D uh, to 10, um, then our G value is not correct. It isn't 12 anymore. Uh, we should actually go from B to C, which is 10 plus 3, uh, which is 13. Uh, so instead of changing G, we first want to change R which uh, to 13. And because this increased, we got a worse path. We set G to be equal to infinity. Um, yeah, and then because uh, we're not sure of its G value, then we, we enter it into our priority queue. And then, because uh, node B's information changed, it has to update um, its predecessor. So it tells node A um, there's been a change in the path, and node A cha also changes its RHS to a lower value. Um, and basically, um, for A, this would be an over-consistent um, example. So if it actually gets a better path, and then, oh, oh sorry. Um, so, okay, we, we expand the nodes according to our queue, and then so the lowest value is actually B, and then we will just <coughs> update uh, G to be, be equal to the minimum value that we found, which is 13, and then we will go to A and um, update its value. And, uh, okay. um, so uh, one thing is that when after we calculate um, one path and we have to move the robot, uh, we now have a new start node. And if you recall, our heuristic was um, the number of nodes, the distance and number of nodes to the start node. And when we move the start node, this distance changes. Uh, so we have to keep track of this using uh, H prime, where we basically just calculate the difference in our heuristic from the new star node and the old star node, and then we can add it um, to our keys to so that we maintain a consistent priority queue. Okay, and uh, we're running low on time, so I will be skipping this example, um, but you can look at the example uh, in the slides. Mm -hmm. Well, the demos are very nice, so these will be uploaded later, so you guys can see. Okay, so I'll just go through that real quick. Okay, so um, earlier Alex talked about any angle approach to beta star that builds off of A star. Turns out we can do the same thing with D star as well. So field D star, as it says here, is an implementation of D star that lets us basically move away from the rigid 2D grid structure that we gave ourselves in the beginning does this by basically saying that we can go in any angle as long as it's like a linear interpolation to points. And this 
again, lets us move plan paths that are going to be much smoother and more optimal. And what's really nice is that this has actually been used in the real world. Um, for example, on Mars with the rover Spirit and Opportunity. So maybe this is something that Mark Watney could have looked at if he were in the situation. Okay. Um, so we can add those there. Um, another, um, another major limitation is the fact that there are resource constraints. And these are things that affect the mission on the whole. For example, the overall battery that we have left, or our budget for risk, so forth, things like that. So how might we get, um, how might we account for those? Uh, one algorithm that we looked at is constraint D star, known as, also known as C star. And what this does is it takes the global constraints and factors it into its object the objective function. Um, it does this by um, trying to determine what the best way to weigh this constraint by to have the best balance between optimality and feasibility. And it runs D star a couple of times every time we change this weight. Um, main idea of this is that, um, like I said, Every time it runs a search, it's going to store that stage of the search. And because it's using D star, again, whenever there's new information that appears, we're going to go and update our path, which is what repairing refers to. Um, and we check to see what are the weight that we weigh our global constraint, what are that needs to be changed. If it doesn't need to be changed, then we'll just go up and fix the next stage. If it does, then we're going to go and just replan everything. Um, what this basically essentially looks like is that we're kind of having n different graphs all in parallel of our environment, where there's one graph for every weight value that we're going to try out. And then at the end, this algorithm is going to use binary search to decide which of these weight values is going to be the best weight. So that's pretty cool. This builds off of D star. Um, a few other limitations that we didn't really get to go in depth into. Uh, one of them being the fact that we are confining ourselves to the 2D grid. Uh, if, we were, if we want to work in three dimensions, which is more realistic, what we can do is use a 3D vector field, um, just building off of the 2D vector field that we have. This might be a little bit more computationally expensive, but it's fine. Another alternative we, can, we saw in some of the papers that we read is um, the, this layer method, where we take the entire space that we have and split it into discrete layers, each of these layers being a 2D plane. 2D vector field at a different depth. And what our AUV can do is just go and move up and down, stepping through these different layers whenever it wants to change its depth. Okay. Another issue is the fact that our AUV doesn't really learn anything about the currents. Our AUV is going to have to rely a lot on information about the currents that's provided to us from the start, or what it might approach on its way to the goal. Um, this could probably be, probably be improved by adding some sort of machine learning component to it so that our AEV can predict how the currents will behave, but it's not something that we really have touched on much. And finally, as we stated in the beginning, we ignored a lot of the physical, kinematic, and dynamic constraints of our AEV. Because for now, we're just pretending our AEV is just a point that can do how can behave how we want it to, but in the real world, once we put any of these algorithms in action, we're going to have to consider the fact that our AV cannot make sharp turns or move as quickly as we might want it to move. So there's still a lot of work that can be done to improve and build off of all these algorithms that we talked about earlier. Yeah. All right. So now we're on the last bit of this. I'm going to wrap up the stuff that we learned in this project. And if we have time, give a short preview of that piece set. Um, so what did we learn? When it comes to, well, there's two parts. So the, for, when it comes to the modeling, there were a lot of features that we looked at to figure out what makes a good model, and we talked about those. For example, we chose to use a 2D space. Uh, we, choose, we chose to model our obstacles as 3D functions, and then took slices of those functions to figure out what the boundaries for all those obstacle regions are. Um, looking at the obstacles and the hazards together, we created a risk field to assign a value of risk for every point that's on our grid. And then at the end, we overlay the vector field on top of the entire environment so we can provide information about how the currents work in here. When it comes to the algorithms, we focused a lot on trying to make our cost heuristic as effective as possible, making sure we take in all the properties of the environment that we're working in. We also looked at ways to account for uncertainty through, say, like the Gaussian blur that Alex talked about or dynamic replanning for dealing with unexpected changes in our environment. And we also try to step away from the 2D grid 
and see where that would take us with those algorithms. So here's kind of like a summary of some of the, all the algorithms that we talked about today in this presentation. This list is not exhaustive. There's a lot of different methods that are being out, being used out in the world right now today, but we thought we would just provide a highlight of some of the more interesting algorithms that would solve like a variety of different problems that we encountered. Um, so it's kind of a lot, but um, in the end you might be wondering what's the overall takeaway from all this? Well, throughout this project we went through and looked at a huge variety of landscape, or a huge variety of algorithms um, out there, and we took, we kind of went through and identified some advantages and disadvantages. So when it comes to working on the final project, what we're going to do is we want to take a look at what our project is, what our mission needs are, and what our environment needs are, and try to match it with an algorithm, with the properties that will suit those requirements. Um, so that was kind of like our idea for this. For the grand challenge, our goal is basically to take these algorithms that we talked about today and actually apply them, and then figure out which one will give us the best performance. Um, for our PSET, it's going to basically just be a, like a simulation of this. We'll let you guys play with the heuristics, the model of the environment, um, some of the code for the path planner. Um, but at the end of this, I hope you guys all kind of learn a little bit more about how you can plan energy efficient paths in uncertain environments such as this underwater volcano or up in Mars or whatever. But more, and more importantly, we hope you guys figured out from this presentation a way to bring you a little bit closer as you're reaching your dream job. Thank you. Questions for the team? Do we have time for a couple of questions? Yes. Um, so, so if I'm not mistaken, the colliders, the AUVs that they use are often colliders, and I think that was classified for like the grand challenge. And so these obviously move very distinctly up and down. I was just wondering what guys would, yeah. what do you think would be a good approach to expand this and like incorporate that type of motion planning? So one of the one of the papers we actually looked at quite a bit was considering a glider and in that case um, we have these kind of piecewise linear parts and in that case each node is where the glider would surface and so then all your hazards and stuff are actually on the surface and so uh, sort of a risk region might be like a shipping lane and so that what you're then saying is that those are areas where you're going to surface and like relocate and then you're going to dive back down and you're kind of I think in their case, they were assuming that underwater is a lot safer. And so then you kind of, each segment is diving down and doing like the zigzag glider pattern and then resurfacing at the next node. So that's an example of what we could do. Again, I think none of us are particularly familiar with AUVs or, or gliders, so that's something we might look at more in the final project. I mean, we would probably, at the moment, we abstract everything to a 2D space, and then we would probably have some distance, between, so we would probably add up layers at, at a certain distance too. Yeah, again, a disc discretization in that direction. And then the, the final thing is, if the part that we're actually interested in and in searching around is now at a relatively constrained level, now that we've reached the seafloor or something like that, now we can plan on this specific level of our thing. So the dive down might not be so important to plan for. Uh, while it's definitely something to consider, when we're actually searching around the volcano itself, that might be constrained to a much more specific depth. Uh, but there's definitely extensions to it. Other questions? Surely you have more questions. <laughs> okay, well, great. Oh, one more. Good. The grand challenge for tomorrow. Um, if you guys have a duration you would think most confident about based on what you presented today? Well, we certainly have things that we have more implemented uh, than some of the other ones. Um, like, for example, we had the Dijkstra's algorithm one implemented. We have an A-star implemented. We have a base level of the potential field algorithm implemented, but it definitely needs a lot of fixing up and tuning. Uh, if we want to get things correct, A-star is probably going to work best for us because it's the easiest and least amount of chance of us screwing it up. Uh, uh, that's not the answer I think here. But <laughs> <laughs> that's with it being tomorrow. If we have more time to actually like, plan for things. Obviously. You do because you were the second advanced lecture. Yeah. So <laughs> given that, right, that where would you place your your best bets in terms of an algorithm two, plus the grand challenge given that you have? So 
a month and a half or so. Yeah. I would go for like a field D star, maybe with like the Gaussian blow for some uncertainty. Okay. These but are methods are being used by other researchers, people who are only five, so that's probably a good sign. But it depends on, like, I guess none of us are really sure how important the dynamic replanning is in our mission. Like, I mean, none of us are, I guess, familiar enough with the scenario. Like, if, you know, if that's something that's important, we would definitely focus on the D star type family. If not, we could do like A star family or like the. Because uh, we also realized that timing of the actual traversal of the path is important for energy efficiency, but we don't really have a notion of how much timing for planning matters. If we have days to plan for something, we don't have to be as efficient in our planning, and we can focus more on creating the best path. But if we want to be able to plan things quickly or replan things quickly, then D star type algorithms now become more important. So, quickly. <laughs> OK, so yes. I mean, well, so, so in our experience so far, we've been doing off board, right? Yeah. Because, of because of risk, computational limits. Right, but we want to be able to, when we're at the surface, then we'd like to be able to get up and down with the sockets. Right, in these cases where you are trying to then say that you're adapting kind of based on whatever sonar or sensors that you have available underwater, so that you're actually pre planning underwater based on what you see, then you do want to do it in a very memory efficient manner, and you do want to be able to do it on the sockets. I just another question. Um, what do you think, so you Using kind of sampling based motion planning methods? Yeah. Do you have any like opinions on that is appropriate for this kind of problem or like right. why you didn't really go in that direction? So we looked into it briefly um, and we realized after we kind of pushed it aside that there are definitely ways we can do it. Uh, but our initial attempt, we were running into a lot of issues with actually making it work with our currents um, due to the fact that we're picking random paths it's hard to actually pick random paths that always follow a current and then actually give us a good path. Um, we realize that there's a way that you can weight the sampling so that it is now going to pick paths that you know use the currents to your benefit. Um, but we really didn't look too far into it. And then there's also apparently a problem with uncertainty um, and risk allocation. It doesn't work great with uh, sampling based methods. Yeah, I think. Kind of the key takeaway there is like the, the currents you'll face in practice are often quite structured naturally. So then, a kind of using a random grid, you get this completely unstructured kind of traversal, which you could maybe smooth or something. But what we found was that when we ran like PRM or RRT, it kind of wasn't really benefiting from the currents because of that random. Um, and if you do like bias your random generator, you're kind of moving towards a structured grid in some sense anyway. So, yeah, but that's something we could look into a little more. Okay, I think it's 12, so maybe. <laughs>